Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Glad to see you all here. Thanks for coming out in the, in the rain. Uh, my name is Lisa Guernsey. I'm the director of the Early Education Initiative here at the New America Foundation. And I'm, I'm very excited about what may unfold in the next hour. I think this is a conversation that we're not having enough. And um, I've learned a lot just even in the past couple of months um, about some of the demographic data and what it's going to mean for our future and for education policy. And I'm excited to learn yet more as this conversation moves forward today. So um, I will do a very brief introduction, but most of our uh, activity this afternoon will be to hear from Dal Price, I'm sorry, Dal Myers, excuse me, who is a demographer and professor in the Sol Price School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. Um, and uh, Dr. Myers, he's Rex, the Population Dynamics Research Group um, at USC. He's also the author of the 2007 award-winning book, Immigrants and Boomers, and has also then since then done numerous studies to look at what our population dynamics mean for us as a country, for everything from immigration um, policy issues to early childhood and um, children's health issues as well. He's the author of a very recent paper that came out in January, um, California's Diminishing Resource, colon, Children. And I had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Myers um, present on this work a couple of months ago in Sacramento, where a lot of us were convened to talk about early childhood education, early childhood policy, and what's coming down the road for us. A lot of the insights um, that he presented back in Sacramento um, a couple of months ago opened my eyes to some new things that we should be thinking about, particularly when it comes to our um, fam low-income families, children in um, poverty, and children in um, immigrant families, and how they will be moving through our education system. So it was a real pleasure to hear him speak, and I'm very happy to be able to bring you all the same um, experience this afternoon. I'm just set up just quickly um, a, a couple of data points, and then I'm going to let Dr. Myers kind of take it from there. In 1970, in the state of California, children made up about a third of California's population. But by 2030, that figure is expected to decline to just about one-fifth, or 21%. This declining child population is evident not only in California, but in a lot of the states in the Northeast and in the Great Lakes. And it's going to have some implications for all of us as we move forward. As our baby boomers age, is society prepared to have fewer working adults serving more retirees? Is our education system built to develop the potential of children in, um, in low-income and immigrant families who will comprise the bulk of the workforce of the future? And, and are we supporting the, the parents and the grandparents who are raising um, our children today and our um, generations for tomorrow? So I will leave you with those questions as I um, hope you will join me in welcoming Dr. Myers to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Mars, for being here. Thank you very much, Lisa. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out in the rain. It's really great for me to be here in the rain. I'm from California. We never see rain. It's so exciting, except when your umbrella breaks. I have a new umbrella. I never used it before, and it doesn't work. Um, you know, I'm a demographer, so I'm supposed to tell you lots of boring details, and I'm going to put on my green eye shade and give you lots of facts you'll have to memorize. But in fact, really, demographics are the most exciting story in America today. It's told in many different ways, and many people fumble the ball and tell a broken demographic narrative. And really, it's, uh, there's so many twists and turns. And let me just share you, with you in a brief time today what we found out in California. But first, you realize that demographics are very personal to people. It's all about age sex, race, immigration, all these, you know, very volatile issues. And so we have to start with what people really think about kids, and then we'll look at the data. So there's a lot of ambivalence. Basically, kids are too expensive. And it's really not fair that we should be burdened with other people's child costs, is it? That's what I read in the paper. And all these kids are going to overwhelm us. 
And the immigrants, what about the immigrants? And if you don't think they're not related to this, read the letters to the editor. A story about kids turns into a story about immigration. Okay, they're not all immigrants, but who invited them in the first place and we can't afford these kids? And these minorities are having way too many kids, the story goes. Um, all this is actually wrong, but it's in the stories. And these children are supposed to be the future, but are they really the future? And whose future? And that point is actually never made. We just assume that kids are the future. I assume it. Then I realized that other people didn't believe it. What do you mean you don't believe it? Okay, well, so we have to get into the details in a way that makes sense. And so to do that, I'm going to look backward 20 years and then look forward 20 years. And that way you can see the future better when you realize it's a total change from the last 20 years. It's a total reversal of outlooks. And in California, um, there's like four big points that have shaped all the politics there. One is that growth, growth has been booming out of control. We have to chase people away. We don't need all these people. There's been runaway immigration. Total foreign-born takeover has been expected because of the rapid changes. And high fertility, way too many kids. And the growth is coming from outside. These are outsiders that we can turn away. That was the attitude the last 20 years. Well, uh, that was true maybe in 1990. There was some factual support for, in part for some of these ideas. But by today, Everything is reversed. Growth has slowed down dramatically. It's no longer, it's a, st it's a slow, steady increase, no longer booming. Immigration has diminished. It's, it's no longer rising in an accelerated rate the way it was. Fertility has plunged, and there's a shortage of children now, not a surplus. And growth is coming from native-born Californians, people born in California, raised in California schools their whole lives. It's a, it's a totally different outlook. So we're trying to get a grip on that politically in California to realize that we're responsible for our own children. That's a new idea, believe it or not, because California has been a temporary society of people who move there, like Arizona is today, temporary people who move there, and they don't really have a full view of a lifetime in the state. Let me show you briefly just the, the continuing um, low population growth, because this has actually affected other studies that have been done that people are still using the old data. They don't realize that those data were were wrong maybe when they were invented. And the old data are, are come from 2007. That's not very long ago. The Census Bureau's old data come from 2008. And they've, everything has been revised now this year. And so it's, it's a rapid change. So here we have a, this graph here shows you the growth each decade in California. And one thing that's interesting for you guys to know about is that right here, this is because of Washington, D.C. did this. In the 1980s, we had the, more growth in California. Six million people were added in one decade than has ever occurred anywhere in the United States, ever. And that's because of decisions in Washington to build up defense spending, uh, Ronald Reagan's presidency. A lot, a lot of that defense spending went into S Southern California. And so, meanwhile, Texas was having an oil bust. I was living there then. The Midwest was in the, the Rust Belt crisis. New York was going bankrupt. And all the growth rolled to the West Coast and went to California. Unfortunately, many people think that boom right there was like a permanent condition. That's like a gold standard. It's a very much an aberration. And you see the next two decades have come in much lower. Um, but the, project, the forecasters didn't quite realize that. And so they were still thinking in 2007, there will, will there be this much growth each decade? Because these were aberrations, they thought. And we would get back up to normal more. Well, with the census data results, we realized that normal is not like that. Normal looks like this. And all the forecasters are coming in much lower now. And lower growth, in part, is lower children, lower migration. Uh, it's lower everything. So it's been a, a change in the booming growth. It's a big change in California. How big? We thought we were going to hit 50 million people. We were expecting to get it by the year 2032. And now the new projections from the same agency say we're not going to get it until 2049. It's a 17-year slowdown. That's a pretty big correction in your growth expectations, 17 years. Now, the more dramatic stuff is immigration. And here I'm going to compare the U.S. along with, uh, with California. Uh, this is a method I've developed for estimating immigration in prior decades. And we'll, I want to look at the, gr the flow of annual arrivals and show how it's accelerated. So here it is for the U.S. compared to 1970. Whatever, the flow is pretty, pretty small in 1970. And since then, it accelerated to a point where like 250% more people coming each year that, to the U.S. than were coming in 1970. 
And then after 2000, this flow turned downward. Um, this is 2006, before the recession. Here's 2010. So it's, it's sort of down there, and maybe now we're waiting to see what happens next in the, in the US. In California, it peaked much earlier because of that big boom in aerospace spending, and then dropped off. And in LA County, where I live, it's dropped off even more dramatically. I think the basic point here is that uh, immigration tends to boom in different places at different times. And then it doesn't maintain that, that same rate. It, it kind of then subsides again, and the boom moves to some other state. So California's already peaked, and other states will peak. And other states are this rising now. They, uh, it's being spread more broadly across the nation, which is a good thing. Uh, and in the total foreign-born takeover that was supposed to be happening, well, in California, it had been rising dramatically, and they were expecting it would go like that. And in fact, it's, since 2000, it's really just, that's LA, here's California. It's really flat. The US is still rising s steadily, but at, at a more gradual rate than it did in here. In the 90s was this abrupt rise, and in many localities it made people sort of get worried about what was gonna come next, but it's much more gradual than people fear. So with fewer immigrants, you also get fewer parents, and that will have an impact on your child population. We've had a total generation transformation already in California People are still thinking we have to fight the old war here of uh, too many kids, and it's gone the opposite direction. Here's the number of babies born each year since 1970 in California. And so uh, back here, 100,000, that's LA County, uh, 300,000 in, in, in California, 100,000 in LA County, born in 1972 about. And after that point, this dramatic rise just a huge increase, uh, doubling the number of babies born each year. And believe me, there's many school district planners who took those trends and said, well, gosh, you know, we're going to need this many schools. You know, they kind of overshot. But who would predict it would turn around and drop so abruptly? In LA County, it's 35% fewer kids now than back at the peak in 1990. So the absolute numbers are going to recover. This is from the state forecasts. They're going to recover, but um, they're not going to get back to the peak that it was there before. So we know there's fewer babies. Now, in terms of the total population, you can count it different ways. Uh, but the share of the state's population that are children in each of these age groups is, is tapering down. And whether that's a, ish, a problem or not uh, is hard to determine, because what, what, what does a number mean exactly? So I'm going to try to look at it different ways. Let me turn and compare some other states, though, I think, first. We should look at not just California. Here's California. California lost 3.5% um, of all of its kids under age 10 in the last decade, a net decline. But California, as you can see, is not the worst state. There's other states that are much worse off. Uh, the New England states or Michigan or New, uh, New York, C Connecticut, Massachusetts. Here's Ohio. Here's Illinois. Illinois is about twice the loss of, uh, of um, California. So it's pretty widespread. There's one big winner in the, in, the, in the children's business, and that's Texas. The state of Texas attracted 578,000 net increase in kids under age 10. Well, the, the nation only had 800,000 increase. Texas got five-eighths, or two-thirds, of all the kids that were added in the nation went to Texas. Because I think because their parents must have gone there. The parents went there because maybe there were jobs there. But we should send a message to Texas, it's not fair. You can't hoard all the kids. We need kids elsewhere. But, um, but by and large, the nation as a whole, it's just about 2% increase. These are all the states that had less than a 2% increase. And it's widespread, it's, but it's more of a national problem because you see these kids, they are our national labor pool. They may be living in Texas today, but Texas is educating our future workers, and we hope they're doing a good job. Now, um, can I just put this in a little bit bigger perspective? Because I'm not really a children's expert. I'm an expert on the bigger demographic structure and how the kids relate to the other groups. So I have to show you all the other groups here. And you've seen this, this information before. This is, but while these are the new projections from the Census Bureau, all I'm showing you is the baby boomers. But what I'm doing is I'm going to show you the growth from 1990 to 2010. In the last 20 years, 
how many people were added in these age groups. And you can see the wave, the big green wave of baby boomers that washed across America. These are the millennials down here. People talk about them as being the next big generation. They're pretty big, but they're not that big a wave. They're not much greater in size than the people who are ahead of them, so they don't have any, that, as much of a boost. But they are pretty good. During this period in here, however, you, you notice we're losing uh, young people. If you're use, losing people in these age groups, you're losing parents. There was a shortage of parents. And so we couldn't have as many kids. And if you add a lower birth rate on top of fewer potential parents, you're going to have a drop off in babies. But we sure had a lot of late middle aged people. And I sometimes joke that these are the good guys. Well, they're my people, the baby boomers. But, but people that in those age brackets are your peak earners, your peak taxpayers, your peak homeowners, your peak campaign contributors, they are really, you know, the bread and butter of the, of the American economy. And we had a big surge in those age groups. So now I have to show you the next 20 years. And being a demographer, I always joke that, unlike economists, I can predict the future. They can't predict interest rates three months ahead. I can predict in, in 20 years' time, everybody in this room will be 20 years older. <laughs> And it's not a really big accomplishment, but it's very illuminating. So here you go. I'm going to do the prediction using the Census Bureau's own projections. And the, the, the green wave of the good guys has now moved over here. Now these are the bad guys now. They're taking all the entitlements. It's the same people, of course. And they, they deserve their entitlements. But there's a now a big hole in late middle age where we had that big gain before. Now we're not gaining anybody. The millennials are in here. It's a lot riding on them. They're going to have to hold up uh, all the working age population. And then we hope there's this many kids that are being added at, at a fairly low rate. But we hope that the Census Bureau is right on that. So that's the big picture on the demographics. But to put it really into perspective, I have to like, look specifically at the seniors and how many seniors we're going to have relative to the working age population. And so I'm just going to do a ratio of people age 65 and older divided by working age. And I'm going to call working age 25 to 64. That's prime working age. And you notice that it, there's not, not much to show you here. This line here is for LA. Uh, no, this is, the, this is for the US. This is for California. This is for LA County. It's, it's kind of the same in almost every state. It's about 24 seniors per 100 working age. The point is, for the last 40 years, nothing's changed. Anything that's constant is totally taken for granted, totally invisible. Nobody notices it. We can't imagine anything different because it hasn't changed in 40 years. That's my entire working life. Nothing has changed. You want to see the next 20 years? It goes up 65, 75, 80%. 100% in some cases, but in just 20 years, by 2030, in the U.S., it goes up a good two-thirds. Uh, I looked at all the states in the nation, and the state that went up the lowest was Oregon. And Oregon went up over 50%. The senior ratio rises everywhere. And the important point of this graph is, is to point out that uh, this ratio was constant, and now, now we have to wake up. And it's totally predictable. I can add 20 and figure this out. And yet we're acting like it's not going to change. And so it, it's the source of all our problems, really. You know about Social Security. You know about Medicare. Maybe the workforce replacement crisis you haven't quite realized. These people are all retiring. These are prime workers. We've got we to replace them all. These are also big taxpayers, and they're, they're moving on to being more recipients. We have a deficit crisis because, well, this is built into the, the, the budgets of the federal government and the state governments. And we also have a home seller crisis because one thing the older folks do is they sell homes. And who do they sell their homes to? They sell them to younger folks, and what was a nice steady ratio is just <laughs> tilted out of balance here, so we have to wonder a little bit about who's going to buy your house. And it will be a child who's currently in school. But in 20 years' time, they'll be um, in the housing market, and we have to get ready, help them get ready. So the problem is that there's older folks who really deserve their entitlements, and they're going to be... Uh, consuming a lot of the federal budget, and there's, and there's these kids who we need to really, you know, invest in more heavily. And there are some people say, well, there's, oh gosh, there's this conflict of old versus young. And they would pick them as being two opposite forces with a, with a zero-sum pie, and they're, they're fighting over their shares of the pie. 
And I, I disagree with that, that framing. I think it's more of an intergenerational partnership where really there's mutual benefits to be gained. And really, it's not an animosity at all. Really, there's a lot more love there than you would think. <laughs> so let's look at the responses here to the senior ratio. These things are all going to happen. They already have happened. It, it must lead to re reduced uh, growth in GDP because there's fewer workers, relatively speaking. It will be at least delayed retirement. That's already happening. And it's going to lead to reduced and delayed senior benefits. And it's going to lead to higher taxes. All these things must happen. It's also going to lead to something really good. It puts an extreme premium on young people. They're going to be really in demand in ways we can't imagine right now because we're in a recession with high unemployment. As soon as these boomers just get out of the way, it's going to open up enormous positions, um, opportunities for young people if they're ready. And it's going to also lead to greater reliance on immigrant workers to help us. Uh, they're not going to solve all the problems, but they can maybe solve a quarter of the problem. And then there's still three quarters to go. We don't know how we're going to do it exactly. But one way is it leads to a rediscovery, I hope, of neglected minority youth. People who have not been used to their full capacity really need to come on board now. We need to take everybody really seriously and treat them with the respect they deserved all along. But now we really need them, and we need to, we need to get them going uh, and be full contributors. So we can't let anybody, anybody drop out of school. That idea is crazy. That's an idea that's ancient from when we had a surplus of kids and we could afford to let people drop out and we didn't worry about everybody because we had plenty of kids. Uh-uh. It's all hands on deck now. And we need to really make sure everybody is performing at their, at their optimal abilities with more active counseling. We need college aid, financial aid for everybody. We need to have universal preschool. These are all important for getting the maximum out of every kid we have given the shortage. It's not just a nice thing to do. But the seniors themselves need this. And this is an important message because the seniors are the voters who control a lot of these purse strings. It's not for the good of the kids only. It's really for the good of the seniors. So we have a reversal of outlooks. Back in the old days, it was a high fertility. It was too many children, growing tax burden, and very few elderly. And now today, everything's reversed. Uh, as you can see here, we have a shortage of children, not enough taxpayers and workers for the future. And the baby boomer tsunami is creating this soaring senior ratio that really will be the centerpiece of our, of our social policy for the next 20 years, social and economic policy. And so the, these, the children have, are a big part of the solution. So it's really a revolution in how we think about the generations. So now I want to come to the new importance of children and this be really specific here. How do we measure that? It was in this report. We featured it here. Also developed it in this other study of LA um, where we did our projections for L.A. County, and, and this is supported by the uh, Lucille Packard Foundation. This is about the first five L.A., um, where we developed this method. It works off of the senior ratio, and I call it the ICI. All it is is figuring out for each kid who's born, how much will the senior ratio increase by the time they get to be age 25? And, and as that ratio grows, that puts more and more weight on each kid. And that growing weight tells me how much more important they are. Simple as that. And so it's, before, it's not like a growing number um, like we had before. Not enough children means not enough of all these things. And so we want to know how to measure this. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go through it, the details, but it's really just three points here of how to, how to do it. And it's in the, the report there. I can show this to you later. Uh, time's a little bit short, so I won't go through the exact math. But I just say that when you do this ratio and you play it out, you want to look at a kid who's born in 2015, it turns out that their ratio looks like this. Here's that, it's, it's pretty flat up until 1985. And for kids who were born in 1985, they would turn 25 in 2010. And starting in 2010, this ratio is rising. And so the kid who's born after, after 1985 is more and more important so that a kid who's now born or will be born in 2015 is twice as important as kids born back here. Twice as important. So what does that mean we should do about that? Well, there's lots of possibilities. But I just want to emphasize one thing, which is in policy circles, the most important thing is how do you frame the problem? What is the problem? And then we'll let people negotiate solutions. But the real battle is over what is the framing. Given a shortage of kids, 
we have to answer this question. Why should I really place greater value on kids? Why should I give them greater priority for scarce resources? When we have so little money, we're in a fiscal crisis. How can we afford money for anybody? Why should I? Why should I do more than was the usual neglect of the past? Well, why? It's because of that, that index of children's importance, which just doubled. That's why. It's not like the past. It's double. So we have to make the most out of our fewer children. And we have to figure out where are they? Who are the new kids? So in the um, Lucille Packard report, Diminishing Children, we have a whole section, Ethnic Diversity. And I ask the question here, so who are these children on whom society will rely so heavily? And it's really presented here as a by the way. It happens these are going to be much more diverse. Half of the kids in California today are born um, uh, with, um, with um, immigrant parents. Um, half are also born with um, mothers who are uh, Latinas. Um, and some of those mothers are foreign born, some are native born. Um, ma majority of, of kids are born with uh, parents of color. So the point is that first there's a shortage of kids and secondly, whoever they are, uh, we need to get the greatest potential out of all of them. We need to get all hands on deck and it's only fair as a matter of equity that we invest most in those children who are um, disadvantaged because they had the greatest upside potential to expand their capabilities and to give us the extra boost that we are going to require because of people like me who are going to be the baby boomers swamping the senior ratio. All this comes back to a simple philosophy which is lost sight of in American politics. American politics is all about today or the election tomorrow, but it's very short range. In reality, social policy is a whole lifetime. You have to look at people cradle to grave from when they're born all the way through their life. And it's a real simple relationship that is actually true in every society on earth. It all works the same way. There's children born and we invest in the children and then the children, lo and behold, they grow up, add 20, they grow up, and they become middle-aged and then they become seniors and they get to retire and get their, their entitlements. It's a no-brainer, but we forget about it because we live in the present. We think these children are a separate interest group. They're taking money away from somebody else. Well, you're not taking money away. You're investing in them. These people here are the big taxpayers, and we should give them a lot more respect than we do. They are really contributing triple the tax dollars that they ever get back uh, it, while they're you know, in, these, in this age range. They will get it back later. They're going to move to this age. They'll get it back in you know, big time. But initially, they're, they're contributing this way and this way. And these kids then grow up and become new workers, new taxpayers, and new home buyers. And they, our investment is pays off by the time they get to be age 35 or so. And then they, of course, advance through the cycle. This cycle of roles is really the framework that ties everybody together. It's the one common denominator that really binds all ethnic groups, immigrants and native-born, all together. And why we don't talk about it is beyond me, um, but it's really the simplest way to understand social policy. So my conclusions. Um, I would ask what's the most surprising finding about everything that we, we pulled out of our, our generational future study for California. You know, is it the leveling off of the foreign born? That's kind of surprising. Or is it the new majority who are homegrown and you know, born in California, not born somewhere else? Or could it be this explosion of seniors? That's not surprising. Well, maybe it is. Or is it the scarcity of children? And, if, and the fact of their, their doubled importance in the future, is that the most surprising? I think what it comes down to is really this bottom line here. It's just the realization that maybe the generations might actually be connected to each other. After all, that might be the most surprising thing, at least in California politics, because we don't act that way. And when you see it animated over time, the truth of it, I think, is inexorable. So we have more information available if you'd like to see about it. Um, I thank you very much. Okay. So we're going to, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Myers a few questions and then we'll open it up because I'm sure a lot of you have many questions you'd like to ask as well. Um, we were talking before um, this presentation about the recognition that, oh gosh, kids 
grow up and they kind of, they do. What, how, how does that happen? They actually become the adults <laughs> that it, you know, 10, 20 years from now we're going to be relying upon. And, um, and this, I, just a quick kind of personal reference, this is very much coming home to me right now because I have two kids in elementary school, one of whom this week is graduating from elementary school or moving up into middle school and I'm kind of shocked that this has suddenly happened to me, that I have a child who is actually growing up. She's not supposed to do that. She's supposed yeah. to stay really little and cute. But you too have um, children who have now, they're in, the, in their 20s. Is that what yeah. you told me earlier? Yeah, kids in their, in their 20s are still kids. Um, yes. They're always your kids. Yes. But yeah, yes. they're wandering the country. They're in Texas, actually. Texas is stealing them back. And they're probably, yeah, they might have kids in Texas. They're just going to oh, make no. that Texas population no, boom and boom and boom. they're coming back to California. They're coming back to California. But one of them was actually born in Texas already, so he's got one foot out in there. Well, one of, you, one of the things that did strike me as very interesting is um, that it is uneven across the country a bit in, in terms of where we're seeing right. um, the kind of declines in um, babies being born and the growth of them. And um, I wanted to, to, to go to that point a little bit more because some might think, um, oh, well, this, you know, sure, maybe California, I've got to be a little bit worried there. And, yeah, yeah, it doesn't look so good for those, you know, Great Lakes states. But, you know, that's what's going to happen when you have cities like Detroit or Chicago that are kind of in some financial trouble. But, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out because these other parts of the country will come through for us. But as you noted earlier as well, it's not just that there are places where there's a literally like kind of a decline in the number of babies born. It's that we have this population of baby boomers who are retiring. So no matter, even if there were slight upticks, in fact, in our growth of children, it still might not be enough to cover what we would need. Is that, yeah, is that I mean, a fair yeah, assessment? Yeah, I mean, it really, it's, uh, you can never have enough kids at this point because we made a big mistake early on, which is now taking it back. I didn't make the mistake, but maybe my parents and their generation, they had a lot of kids. <laughs> The baby boom generation is irreversible. Once it's born, it works its way all the way through the system. And we take advantage of it in some age ranges, when in, and in other age ranges it becomes a burden, but there's a lot of them. And we have to figure out some way to balance it. We can't just sort of let it be top heavy. And so the kids are an important balancing component. And if it, even if they grow 2%, 5%, 10%, it's still not enough. So we, we, the fact that we had this shortage is uh, it, it 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 means it's not it's just not erasable. The only thing that's really doable is to maximize the productivity of those kids, to help them become the best adults they can be, the, the fullest contributors. They're already the kids are going to be born. They may already be be, be born, and the, and the baby boomers are still going to be here. The, only, the missing link in the middle there is ed educating the kids to be the, the maximum producers. So just to throw a statistic in here that to me I hold in my mind at the same time I'm understanding some of this population dynamics that you've put forward, and that is that two-thirds of fourth graders, as uh, assessed by the National Assessment of Educational Progress, are not reading at grade level right now in this country. So um, there. That's that, that, that proficient reading level. The, the level you need to basically be able to do your homework well and to be kind of mm -hmm. on track for, for uh, doing well in high school and, and making it through. So two-thirds of children are not at that level in, in this country. That's not based on subgroups. Um, mm -hmm. That's much worse, unfortunately, for, for many of our subgroups, low income, um, children from low-income families or children from African-American families and um, Hispanic families. Uh, what have you seen in California um, that, I guess I want to make this a, a good and bad question, makes you very worried about those kids when it comes to the educational uh, system there, and what gives you hope? Mm. <laughs> um, well, what, what makes you especially worried? Um, uh, I, well... I worry that we'll continue with the kids thinking that there's not really a good reason to focus in school. They are being very discouraged right now because of the Great Recession. There's really not a lot of jobs available for young people. And so why bother? Well, I mean, why worry? And, I, and so I, I think that there's also, they have older brothers 
or people in the neighborhood, maybe even in some you know, gang bangers who, who say, don't be a chump. Don't be a chump. What are you doing in school? Don't be a chump. You're not going to get a job anyway. I'm worried that they're going to listen to that. And they're going to believe it's going to be true for them too. Because five years from now, when those kids are grown up more, it's not going to be like that. The Congressional Budget Office has the unemployment rate coming uh, down substantially in just three more years. That's before the baby boomer retirements really kick in. And as they retire and go out the door, they open up all these job opportunities. It's like the 800-pound gorilla sitting on top of the, of, the, of, the, of the hierarchy in every office. They move them away, and everybody moves up the ladder. And they bring in more young people at the bottom, and they move up the ladder. So there's going to be lots of opportunities. I just worry that it won't know this. Mm -hmm. And so the kids won't mm -hmm. stay in school. They won't have the motivation to really focus because they don't see that there's this hope that's coming down the road here. That's, that's, that's my greatest worry. Now, the hope is that there is this, open, there is this opening. Mm -hmm. We just have to connect it. So, and I would add to that, I guess, my own, as you're talking, my own hope and worry is that, my worry is that we're not recognizing then what children would need to, number one, be, be ready to succeed even at the elementary school level, because we're not necessarily as focused on making sure that all children have those opportunities in early learning settings um, and engagement with, um, with their own parents and other adults that can help them learn, but that also we're not as focused on what, um, what will really activate their minds and bring out their kind of curiosity and build their background knowledge so that they can get excited about certain fields and, um, and, and feel like, oh, okay, well, there will be a, a career for me at the end of this. Um, and, and so that brings me to some of the other questions I had for you around the policy implications on the education side of, of data like this. Um, I gotta say that at first, you know, when you hear something like, oh, there's gonna be fewer children, or our enrollment numbers may be less. Um, there might be some who say, oh, good, you know, children are expensive. It's kind of what you said earlier. Mm -hmm. um, fewer mouths to feed. Um, we now have in this country a lot of debate and controversy and pain around school closings. Mm -hmm. uh, in some places, those are um, because of um, definitely diminished populations of children and there's just not, uh, doesn't make as much sense to have as many of those buildings open. Um, but we also, um, in, in, as, as kind of people are thinking about all these things, they're not necessarily thinking ahead, as you're, as you're pointing out. They're not, they're just imagining, oh, we can somehow cover our costs better now in these next three or four years because we won't have to spend as much on these kids. We won't have to have the lights on in that school building. Um, instead of recognizing that every single one of those, we need to be investing a little bit more, in fact, in every single one of those children. Is this playing out in what you've been seeing, too? Well, you know, I, I think that you have put your finger right on the big policy struggle, right there. The, the, the gut reaction is fewer kids, ah, less dollars. Let's cut the budget. And yet that's very, very short-sighted. And it should be the opposite reaction. It should be fewer kids, oh my gosh. We should spend more because we have to double our, our, our investment in each child so that they can be doubly productive so that they can hold up twice the load that they're going to have to hold up. The load's not going to go away, I, I guarantee you. It's not going away. And so we have to help them be the kinds of workers that we need and kinds of taxpayers. Now, there is a, there is a formula out there put out by a Nobel Prize winning economist, James Heckman. He calls it the Heckman Equation, mm -hmm. and he's, he's, I'm, I'm, he has a whole website devoted to this. I'm quite, I admire his commitment. Um, he's trying to show everybody that the, the more you invest in kids and the earlier you invest in them, the more they pay back. I know it with college-going kids, that when you invest every dollar in college-going, they, they earn more in income and they pay more in taxes, so we get the return back of four and a half dollars for every dollar we invest. That's for college kids. But for little kids, he says it's even greater. He says that as you build the kid's skills at age four, that then uh, it, it multiplies over time, and it makes them more ready to learn in, in the fourth grade, and it makes them more ready to learn in the eighth grade, and it just accumulates. So you can't wait until they're ready to go to college and say, okay, you know, Johnny, have you thought about college? Okay. We're going to give you a, a scholarship okay. to go to college. Well, <laughs> you really should start a little earlier. And it sounds like it pays off, according to him. I'm not going to argue with a Nobel Prize winner on that. 
Yeah, I, will, I will say he doesn't understand the demographics or he doesn't recognize it. Because mm. if he knew there was a shortage, it would really make his argument even stronger. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, certainly many of those of you who follow the work that we do in the Early Education Initiative know that we've referenced a lot of um, Heckman's research over time. English language learners, I wanted to get your take on, on that from the California perspective, perhaps what you're seeing in some other states. From the statistics that came out of one of your report, if I'm remembering it correctly, it was that um, nearly half of children in California are, are in homes where their, the primary language spoken is not English. Um, they're in schools that um, are in many, many ways uh, having to deal with policies around not, not speaking anything but English, and yet we have research showing that um, if you can couple both English and native language uh, in bilingual ways throughout their schooling and education, especially in their younger years, and even really start with native language building in their younger years, they will have a, a much greater chance of becoming proficient readers and becoming proficient in English. So these are issues that we're, we're grappling a bit with here at the Early Education Initiative, and, um, and Connor Williams, I think, is in the room as well, one of our senior researchers who will be looking at what we need to be doing in our education system to make sure that we're helping um, children gain English proficiency, but also that we're thinking very forwardly about what bilingual education means. So is this something that comes up as you give these talks uh, around the country or throughout California, do people ask, well, what should we be doing for our English language learners? Uh, no. For some reason, <laughs> they don't raise it very much. It's interesting that it's, in California, it's not an issue mm. um, because it's been there uh, an issue for a long time. Um, it's also a, it's such a mixed record, unfortunately, in California. Uh, many people who support um, bilingual education support it uh, on principle. The problem has been in implementation. It hasn't worked out. That the kids who go into uh, English learner classes don't graduate from those classes. They, they mm -hmm. remain in them a long time, and we're not sure why. It's an it's a administrative problem. Um, so this, so, but the issue is not raised a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I raise it more often than people raise it to me. What I worry about is that if the parents don't speak English, how do they help a homework? That's what I wonder about. That, that seems to be a, a structural problem. They can't actually look at the assignments and help the kids one-on-one -on -one the way an English-speaking parent does. So th that's got to be, um, that's got to be a problem. So we need to figure out how to help those kids get homework help uh, without just sort of pushing off on the parents and hoping something happens. Right, right. So uh, I'll open this for questions in a minute, but as you're speaking, it strikes me that here's, a, here's an opportunity if we have, um, if we're really thinking about an intergenerational partnership and we're recognizing how much kind of we need each other, um, seniors who have a lot of wonderful skills and have raised children and understand kids in, in many ways um, and actually sometimes have more perspective on the tantrums than, than those who are closest to them, um, enlisting them in the help with, uh, with a lot of these kids who may need another um, adult in their lives to help them That's uh, an excellent understanding idea. That's their a homework really good idea. everything else. Um, I'm sure I'm not the first one to, to come up with that. No, I don't know There's many that, others too. That's a good um, idea. So let's see. Um, those of you here who have heard this, I'd love to get some of your questions. And please um, introduce yourself quickly. Just mention your name and where you're from, and then just make your question as, as quick as possible. My name is Lincoln Day. I'm a retired demographer. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> uh, I have no quarrel with the statistics that are presented by Professor Meyer. I uh, do uh, differ quite a bit from his conclusions. Um, for one thing, uh, children and people are talked about only in his presentation only as economic entities. They produce, they buy, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and nothing about consuming resources, they consume in the market and that creates jobs and so forth. Um, also as a demographer, uh, I, I would start with the existence of limits. There are limits of physical limits, uh, resource limits, even social limits. Um, I would also recognize that no population can go increasing forever. Uh, somehow, somehow it's going to be resolved that they are going to die and they'll die more quickly if they're using up their resources, 
and energies and so forth. But an, another you can get thing. To your question, sir. Well, the, question, you have a question. the question is, how do you get away with this? <laughs> um, I, what I, I would say, though, is that the demographic optimum it has three things about it. And Very I think quickly. probably Professor Meyer would agree with this. Uh, one is that you have a population with low mortality. Take that as a good thing. Because a population with high mortality is one in which children are dying at a very early age, zero to five in particular. The second one is that it's an unchanging age and sex distribution, ideally. This is the optimum. Because you avoid the great peaks and troughs, such as the sorts of things that are creating the baby boom. Yes, quickly, sir, because I want to make others. sure that we get to And the third one is that you have a zero growth rate in recognition of the existence of limits. Sure. Thank, thank you very much for your question. And before, I just yeah. wanted to mention that, that we are doing this on, on Twitter um, at hashtag support kids. So just wanted to let those out there, especially those listening, know that you can follow us on Twitter. Yes, sir. So I, I agree with the ideal, the zero population growth and, um, and even distribution in all age groups. That's ideal. Um, the problem is we haven't got that now. We have a big lump, as I said, the baby boomers and they are now moving up into older ages. And that big imbalance is the problem. We have to figure out how to handle the imbalance. Um, and all the solutions that I put on the board there are, are not desirable. Raising taxes, delaying benefits, all these are, are things that people are fighting against. Increasing deficits has been one of our biggest strategies. People are fighting against that. So it's really an unpleasant situation, and, but the natural solution is to have more children who can then balance the, um, the, the, um, the structure more evenly. By more children, I'm not saying we should double family sizes, mind you. This is not, you know, our birth rate right now is below the replacement level you recommend. Re uh, replacement level is 2.1 babies per woman. And the U.S. is running about 1.8 babies per woman. Um, that's not going to sustain the population over time. That will shrink the population over time. But we have a temporary problem, which is these baby boomers for the next 20 years. That's the, we can't get to 2050 or 2080, which would be the ideal long run, without going through 2030. How we get to 2030 is the big hurdle. That's the mountain we have to climb. That's the one that's been avoided in all political discussion because there's no political leader who has a solution for it. And, they, and one thing I've learned in politics is a political leader will not mention a problem they don't have a solution for. Because they don't want to be embarrassed when, not, you know, when the camera goes in, in their face and says, well, what's your response, Mr. Mayor? And Mr. Mayor always has a response. Or else he says, well, I don't know about that problem. Uh, so they avoided this one. The aging problem is a serious issue, and it's long range. I wish that we could balance things. But we can't take the baby boomers back. I'm not going back. And I am going forward, and we need other people to go forward together. This will work out if we just realize that the kids we have today are the most precious asset, and we're wasting them. We're not getting the most out of our kids. No, thank, thank you. for That was a very um, good question, provocative as well. And, and the zero population growth piece of this, I think, is one that we need to be yeah. adding into the conversation. Are there other questions in the room? Yes, right here. Hi, my name is John Woodman Sam from the McCain Institute for International Leadership. Um, and I was just wondering, you mentioned briefly as, with the um, states that have lower than 2% growth, and many of the states had negative child growth. Um, where are the, the children being born outside of Texas? I know Texas has a, a very large per capita child spending for, for primary and secondary education, but what about the, the other, uh, for, for primary perhaps, mm -hmm. what about the other states? Where, where are the children being born? How is their education programs compared to you know, the, the, the top tier? Well. Um, a, a lot of them are in, in the smaller states, and so they don't add up to a lot in the national equation. North but Dakota, I saw on your list, right? North Dakota. North Dakota, and it's but all, all through the south, and the, the big champion would probably be Utah, as the highest percentage growth in, in children. Um, so the, the western states and the southern states, and, and, and primarily the ones, but the big states, uh, with the exception of, of Florida and Texas, all the big states are. In, in this, uh, the loser category, it seems like. That's great. Thank you. Another question. 
And I, I guess I should answer in terms of just educational resources in some of those states. That's a, it's a great question, and it's one that I don't have an answer off the top of my, ba uh, my head for, but I would, if I can put in a plug real quick for a database that we do here at the New America Foundation called the Federal, Federal Education Budget Project, um, which is online at um, febp.newamerica.net. And there you can go by state, and you can look at what federal um, Federal money is coming down into the education system. Um, what are the per pupil expenditures by county and by district, et cetera? So uh, let's go to the question in the back. Susan Newcomer from the Population Dynamics Branch at the National Institute of Child Health. Um, I'd also like to point out in Texas, the Texas Ledge eliminated all funding for family planning for mm -hmm. about six or seven years and put unbelievable constraints on abortion. And lo and behold, they had more children. They have now put some more money back into family planning, but that may also be a uh, component of why Texas has had the growth it's had. Very interesting. And that's making me want to also look at, I mean, you had mentioned earlier in your question, um, you know, whether how much Texas is spending kind of per child. Um, I'm, I'm curious about its spending in that zero to age eight range, or especially in that birth to five. Um, that Texas does have a pre-K program, um, but it's not something that all children um, so have access to. And there, um, so next time maybe we need to bring a Texas person, or a couple of them, into the room, and we can learn more about that state. Um, I think it does that as a as a counterpoint. Yes, sir, right here. Um, my name is Kiku Kikuchi, and uh, I'm with Washington Research and Analysis. I retired from the bank, uh, World Bank 12 years ago and have been looking at uh, Japanese demographic population data every month uh, for 12 and, 12 and a half years. And whatever all the things you said about California uh, started about 20 years ago in Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, this year, there are probably, they're just getting parity between 75 years and older and 15 years and younger. There are as many people 75 and over as there are people. Because my wife's group, there were 2.5 million born that year in 1951. And uh, last year, there were 1.06 million uh, kids born in Japan. Now, uh, you may, the question I had is, uh, you showed that something goes up after 2010, that all the curves uh, showed that it was going up. Is that wishful thinking? Because it's not going to happen. The way things are going in Japan, it will keep on declining. Uh, Thank you. Wow. Well, maybe um, I didn't explain that the senior ratio well enough. It's the seniors divided by working age. And Japan has a very high, um, old age dependency like that. So Japan's, you're right, has been rising earlier than, than the US. Japan's ratio is uh, over 50, I think. It's, uh, it's way up there. And Explain the ratio just a little bit more for us, elaborate for those who haven't oh, heard okay. of it before. Well, so typically you would take the, the 65 population and older and divide by the total. And you say, what percent are seniors? So you know, it could be 20% seniors. That's typically how you do it. But a more functional way to do it is the number of seniors compared to the number of working age people. The working age people re represent the, your taxpayer base and the, the workers who make the economy go and the, the home buyers and renters. And so that ratio is, is, is traditionally called the old age dependency ratio. Um, I don't, I, I've written, uh, an, uh, published an essay last year on this. I, I don't like calling it old age dependency because my mother before she died at 86 was never dependent she drove her own car lived in her own house she had more money than the rest of us she wasn't dependent on anybody <laughs> and i just don't think dependency is the right way and that old ratio also sort of includes working ages age 15 and older anybody who's eligible for farm labor is included in our modern information-based economy where we go to school i think 25 is a better starting age for that working age so it's, it's seniors divided by working age times 100. That's the ratio. And uh, it's, it, it's very high in the European countries. Uh, it's been a little slower to rise in the US. And the, and the point I emphasized was it hasn't risen. It's totally flat for 40 years. And we're asleep. We don't know it's a big deal. We, uh, the demographers know about it. 
But the public doesn't know. The voters don't know. Mm -hmm. The leaders don't know. So that's why it stays flat, and then it takes off. And, it, and it, it's been shown in the data for, we've known that for 30 years. No surprise. But now, now that it's, it's happening, people are waking up to it. Very interesting. Yes, right here in the front. Hi, my name is Adal Ward Randolph, and I'm a faculty member at Ohio University. Um, my question is, we've been looking at these numbers since 1983 with the nation at risk. How do you feel this new information is going to alter educational policy so that we can actually put, create policy and implement policy, hopefully funded, that helps to ensure that those minority students do become the workers that you're talking about? I mean, that is a key question. I mean, we've, we've kind of known these things all along, but nothing's happened. I think you need to shock people and wake them up. They just don't take it seriously like it's urgent. They don't feel the urgency. Um, there's two parts to, to policy to being effective. One is you have to show how it's good for somebody, that, some, that it'd be nice for these kids to get an education, it's good for them, it's fair for them. And the other part is you have to show how there's some kind of social cost if they don't get it. And even better, if there's a personal cost to the, to the decision maker, if they don't get it. And if you can combine those incentives all moving in the same direction, you might get some action. The aging of the baby boomers is your big moment to get attention. Because now it shows what's in it for the majority of these voters and why they should care about these neglected minority kids. And I'll just add on that. I mean, that is a, that's precisely why um, we wanted to bring Dr. Myers here. I've had exactly the same questions. I, if you're not familiar with the Early Education Initiative here at the New America Foundation, this is something that we work on quite a bit, is laying out the new policy ideas to ensure that all kids um, are getting the opportunities at very young ages to become learners and see themselves as learners and, um, and to really excel, not just to, not just to kind of get their baseline, yeah, kind of, kind of hit a couple of tests, but actually really excel and, and see themselves as um, the innovators um, for our country for the future. And I, a lot of the times in the research on just even um, what happens in elementary schools, you see that kids are fairly curious and they want to kind of, they're kind of excited to be at school in those early ages. And then something's happening around that fourth or fifth grade mark where the kind of the light's kind of going out of their eyes a little bit. And it really, it worries me so much. What have, what have we done in our, in our school system? Or maybe we haven't prepared those children very well before they even get there. Or something's changing in our, our kindergarten, first, second grade classrooms. It's kind of um, taking that, that light out of their eyes. And so we're looking at you know, what are the things that we can do to make um, classroom experiences incredibly exciting, but to also make sure that all children actually have access to them and that they come um, very much ready to, to just kind of hit the ground running um, with a lot of everything from home visiting programs to early childhood programs, um, uh, pre preschool, much better preschool access that we need throughout this country, uh, much more parent engagement, et cetera. Yeah. So a whole well, line of things we should be doing. <laughs> yeah, and the, although, you know, who does, yeah, <laughs> what can we say more? I just re reflect back on what Lincoln um, Day, is that your name? Mr. Day was saying. Um, if we could get all these neglected kids to really be, become our workers and major taxpayers, we wouldn't need as much growth, would we? We don't need any growth. <laughs> okay, we've got the people here, but we're not using the people. We're not deploying all of, all of our resources. So there is a, a commonality here between reduced population growth and maximizing social policy for, for disadvantaged groups that we can make work together. And then that would be to the benefit of the boomers. I think one of the problems is that you keep talking in numbers rather than percentages. We're not going to have any shortage of children. We are going to have a big difference, as you point out, in the proportion the children are in the total population. Well, it's fewer uh, children than before. So we're, we, I mean, uh, there's a lot of different ways you can talk about what the fewer means well, and refers to. Oh, no, we're, we're losing kids <laughs> right now in California and a lot of other states. So we'll see how long that goes on. It's, it's projected to go another 10 years at least. And that's a hole we'll never recover from. Those are lost kids. If you know, they're not born today. They won't, you can't make them tomorrow. You can't catch up. So 
we're gonna we're gonna close here. I first just want to say it's been wonderful to to have you here to hear some of these statistics to help them help uh, those of us here use them to think maybe a little bit differently and kind of look at something from a different slant to understand better how to think about making the case for investment in in our young people and um, and I mean, just really appreciate. Your, your time. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to share this with you, and thank you for bringing these people together. Yeah, thanks to everybody. Have a great afternoon.